Good day, everyone. Welcome to the latest in our series of webinars on transpersonal leadership. Today, we're going to be focusing on diversity in culture. In this webinar, you'll understand why culture that embraces workforce diversity is good for business. We will explore what diversity is, and it's not just around gender and ethnicity, and what enables diverse cultures and what gets in the way. You will identify how you can promote diversity in your organisational culture and how this leads to the diversity dividend for your organisation. I have the delight to introduce today's speaker. Danielle Grant is a Director of Leadership Global, with many years experience coaching and facilitating programmes at C-suite and senior leadership level. She's a thought leader in blended leadership learning using brain-friendly methodologies. And Danielle is also an accredited university lecturer and has led master's programs in leadership and coaching. In addition to being a co-author of our book, Leading Beyond the Ego, How to Become a Transpersonal Leader, published by Routledge in March of this year, Danielle has also authored articles on inclusion and diversity, published in the US, the UK and India. Danielle has, a, has held pan-European European director level positions in the UK and the US, and for European blue chip consumer companies and also in exec search businesses. She has lived and worked abroad, including in the Middle East, and has family roots across five continents. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you, Danielle. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, so th welcome everybody. Just to let you know, we're going to switch off our video uh, cameras for the duration of the presentation so that things don't get confusing. So I will do that now and uh, move through to the material we're going to go through today. So let's just take a look at this picture for a moment and imagine that you worked in a place that felt like this picture that was celebratory that as you can see has had a track record of being a best company to work for for many, many years. So that company would have a clear sense of purpose that will be shared amongst everybody in the organization. It's a company that will be ethical, authentic, caring, and successful. One that took, play, could, took care of its shareholders and not just the shareholders, all its stakeholders were the employees, the customers or the community that it operates in. Imagine as well that that purpose and that environment enabled the organization to be so nimble that it could respond rapidly and create radical shifts in the organization and develop radical and agile solutions. That input from all was welcomed and valued and innovation and initiative were encouraged. That people of all backgrounds felt valued, listened to and included, that they felt cared about with strong relationships across the board, that there was an expectation of competence from everybody and to everybody and the autonomy to get on with things and a willingness by everyone therefore to give more discretionary effort. Wouldn't that be a place you'd want to work? In our view, that would be a workplace led by a transpersonal leader. So, we're here to talk about culture today in the context of enabling a culture in organisations that embraces diversity in its widest sense. And this is a classic quote from Peter Drucker. And he has said, culture eats strategy for breakfast, but actually culture also eats, eats change for lunch and performance for dinner because the three are intrinsically linked. As an example, both Qantas and Apple, to name but two household names, have identified and embraced the value of diversity in achieving this. As Alan Joyce, the CEO of Qantas, said recently after driving a culture change simply to embrace diversity, that diversity generated better strategy, better risk management, better debates and better outcomes, which I think puts the meat to this quote. So, Greg, would you uh, run poll one so that we can uh, understand how people feel about their current organisations? Yeah, here you are, Danielle. This is the first of the polls that we have this morning. And this question is around which of these statements apply in your workplace? So if you could tick all that apply. Thank you. Well, we have a, a clear 
uh, winner with the, the people are saying they feel accepted, comfortable and safe within their organisations, which is good to hear. Um, and that diverse identities and ways of thinking and working are valued in my organisation. And followed by my organisation has a clear definition of what is considered a, a respectful workplace. But dropping a little behind, the workplace feels respectful and reflects the diversity of its customers and community. And I think that last one is an interesting one that creates a real opportunity for organisations to improve their performance and the way that they relate to their communities and therefore improve their success rates. So really interesting um, poll, Greg. Let's um, close that now and move on. So this image highlights how the operational side of a business can only achieve the vision and the mission and the, through its objectives by balancing the development side, the culture. And to illustrate this, we've all seen retail outlets who say that customer focus is their key um, strategy. And yet we go into the store and we find shop assistants gossiping about their weekend activities and ignoring the customer in front of them. That's just a very simple everyday idea that shows us how if the competencies and behaviours displayed at the customer end are not reflecting the strategies that the business has decided on and the culture is what enables that, then actually it all falls rather flat and the organisational performance will not uh, reflect the vision and the mission of the organisation. So if we look at this diagram a little longer, down the left hand side we say that's the cognitive management side of an organization whereas the right hand side is the domain of the emotional leadership side and it's a very useful way of looking at how to balance your culture with your um, objectives to achieve your mission and success i'm going to let you look at this quote from j Irwin miller um, for a couple of minutes to absorb it Now, these are very powerful quotes and he's clearly a transpersonal leader who was born and yes that does happen but we would say a transpersonal leader can be made through desire diligence and application and really to interpret what um a gentleman miller is saying it's our willingness to look at ourselves including our own biases preconceptions and set these aside that allows growth to occur So what is diversity and what is inclusion? So diversity is our differences. And the first part is really about accepting the value of those differences. And then the second part, inclusion, is about opening hearts and minds to embrace those differences and harnessing the value of that in the organization. So to move on and talk about differences in a little more detail and put a, a, a lens on that. This is a very classic diagram that appears in many places in many guises and it shows us the obvious differences above the waterline that we see when we meet people. So we will notice <coughs> immediately that they may speak a different language, that their taste in food or way that they display emotions may be different. Their dress codes may be different as well and the type of music they enjoy and those are things that we can share and appreciate about each other um, fairly openly but the real issues are those that lie below the iceberg that the values may be different that beliefs thoughts perceptions closely held emotions and attitudes may be very different and it's really below the waterline when clashes occur that the root of them is actually exposed and to understand and manage diversity effectively, we need to consider all both the visible and the invisible differences and deal with them in their own relevant ways. And one useful tool for exploring this is this cross-cultural kaleidoscope that's been developed by my colleague Jenny Playster of 10 Consulting. 
And um, she's developed this as a way of exploring with coaches or with your organization, the different facets of diversity and digging into those rather than risking ignoring something that may prove to be an important value that somebody holds dear that we haven't considered as something to uh, understand. And it's a very useful tool to use in diversity work of all kinds. And uh, it, she has actually written a book called The Cross-Cultural Kaleidoscope, which goes on uh, um, onto this in far more detail than we uh, can explore today. So how, when we've explored these differences and we've started to harness them and understand them, but we need to actually see what are the key areas that we are tending to talk about in an organizational context. So what we've done is we've looked at the world as if it were a village of precisely 100 people with all the existing human ratios remaining the same. And again, I'll give you a few moments to look and understand these statistics. Now, some of these statistics will be familiar to you. Others may be more of a surprise. I mean, for example, many of us who realize that we're living in an aging world may have thought that more than 9% would be over 65 um, and that there would be a greater or smaller percentage of people with disability. So they are statistics that are quite interesting. And of course, there are many, many others that we could have selected. But we felt that these were the ones that were most likely to be considered by organizations in some way in their work. So I'd like to uh, ask you which ones you consider. Greg? Thanks, Danielle. So this poll focuses on what you feel are the most important aspects of diversity. It's a reasonably long list, so if you could just choose three, and for those of you working on smaller screens, you may need to scroll down the screen to see the um, options at the bottom. So the major thing, and this is reflected in our webinar yesterday afternoon that people are considering, is the diversity elements, uh, element challenge of ethnicity. Um, so that is not really a, a surprise. But following hot on the heels of that, we have gender, then age and ability, um, followed by religion and education. Um, sexual orientation seems to be quite low on the, uh, on the agenda, uh, political low, and nobody's considering physical attributes. And that may be how we um, interpret the term physical attributes, whether we interpret it as um, people being good looking or whether we interpret it as people having physical strengths or disabilities. So um, that's an interesting one. Okay, well, I think that we, our selection of attributes to look at was uh, reasonably reflective of your experience. So let's go on to talk about uh, the value of diversity and what it contributes. So diversity contributes a culture of openness, opportunity and creativeness. It delivers bottom line results. It attracts and retains good people, especially younger people for whom these aspects of an organizational life are far more important than they were in previous generations. It increases productivity and diverse perspectives increase innovation and agility. And it results in positive PR and reputation for your organization. And it does some great um, good to your employer brand and your brand for your customers. So let's try and quantify that a little bit. I'm going to walk around this slide um, and talk through the benefits of inclusive culture. This is a very recent report, so these are up-to-date statistics. So organizations with an inclusive culture are twice as likely to meet or exceed their financial targets. They're three times as likely to be high performing, and that includes aspects of new market success. Uh, they're more likely to report market share growth. They're more likely to perform above the stock market average. 
and they're more likely to have higher productivity from individual employees. They're six times as likely to be innovative and agile, and they're eight times more likely to achieve this better business outcomes. And that's on a range of measures, as I say, from stock market performance to profitability to new market entry. And the reason that this happens is that being an inclusive culture means that people are more motivated. If they're more motivated, they have an increased level in engagement. And Hay Group research indicates that engaged employees are up to 43% more productive. And we have experience of this in our own work. A recent follow-up study from a group that we did um, a program that enabled diversity and that looked at developing transpersonal leadership qualities in their teams uh, delivered a massively increased level of productivity where 39 people were delivering the work that they thought needed 51 people to um, achieve with better outcomes. So as I say, we can absolutely corroborate these uh, outcomes from our own work. So let's take a look at which of these aspects you feel are important. Thanks, Danielle. So this poll uh, just asks you which of these aspects listed below are the most relevant to your business. If you could choose two, that would be marvellous. Okay, so the most relevant one people feel is a culture of openness, opportunity and creativeness followed by, uh, with a matched score, diverse perspectives to increase, it, increase innovation and attractive and retaining good people, um, followed by increased in productivity, reputational benefits and bottom line results. And actually that's not a dissimilar pattern to our webinar yesterday um, that, and it may be we have a self-selecting group on here, but it may be that other people would say bottom line results were also equally important. Um, because ultimately that's what this will deliver for people and therefore a sustainable organisation. And I wonder whether this also reflects the fact that um, we now have much fuller employment in a lot of economies and therefore the ability to attract and retain good people uh, is increasingly seen as an important benefit to a company. So there are eight powerful truths around diversity and inclusion. I'm going to briefly explain these points. Diversity of thinking is the new frontier. If you have a homogenous team, you are likely to have people that have come from a similar background, similar education, have had similar childhood and, and um, developmental experiences, and may have always grown up in that industry. And therefore, there is very little challenge to the received wisdom of the organization or of the sector. Um, and diversity of thinking is a new frontier, which means bringing in thinking that is influenced either by ethnicity, by age, by life experiences, by a different sort of education, apprenticeships, and all sorts of different things that will bring new thinking to the front. And as the old phrase from uh, attributed to Einstein says, you cannot solve the problems of the past with the same thinking that created them. Uh, the next truth is about diversity. There isn't any point in having your token woman or your token uh, uh, transgender person in the organization if they don't feel included and empowered to offer their perspectives and the strength of their thinking to the organization. So inclusion is key. Inclusive leaders cast a long shadow or set the scene, as we would say, um, and that's crucial because the leader's role is probably the most important one to set a culture change off, and we will discuss that in detail later. That middle managers matter. Either they can cascade the lead shown by the top leaders, or they can block progress. They are a crucial pinch point for progress to create culture change. 
and that because we're trying to create culture change, point five is about rewiring the system to rewire behaviours, to ensure that people are rewarded and recognised for and encouraged to display behaviours that will enable an inclusive workforce to become a reality. And that that requires tangible goals to make those ambitions real. Uh, there's no point putting everybody on a training program and then having no way to sustain it, no goals to make it live and breathe. Um, so if you say, well, we're going to hire a more diverse workforce, but you don't have diverse hiring teams. Uh, so your first goal has to be to make your hiring teams diverse. The inside and the outside need to match is point seven, which means there's no point having a great slogan or ambitions on your website or in your uh, lobby as you come into the company if the inside of the organisation doesn't reflect that and the behaviours don't make it live and breathe. So what we're talking about is ultimately a culture reset, not a tick the box programme that meets your CSR objectives but doesn't do anything to fundamentally change the culture of the organisation. There's a second part around equality, and that is that equality doesn't mean equity. So if we look at these images on the left, the same support is about equality. Um, however, does equal mean fair? In this image, all the three characters have been given the same support, but clearly they don't have the same experience of seeing the view because what they actually need is differentiated support, as in the second image, which is equitable or fair and enables their individual needs to be addressed. But ideally what we'd like to see is the systemic barrier completely removed. And to give you a very personal anecdote that illustrates this, my late first husband was an insulin dependent diabetic and he and his two brothers, his twin and his older brother, were sent off to the same boarding school, which was obviously many years ago. And in those days, the school gave each parent the opportunity to give their child what was known as a tuck box, which was a box full of goodies that the children could eat through the term. And she decided that she was going to spend exactly the same amount on each child's box. However, the normal sweets that the older two boys could eat were much cheaper than the diabetic sweets that David could eat and so he ended up with half as much in his box and ran out halfway through the term and would beg borrow and steal from others sometimes foods that were unsuitable for him whereas actually differentiated support would have been better whereby she spent um, differentiated amounts but gave them an equal amount of uh, good foods but to remove the systemic barrier would have meant either the school saying nobody had tuck boxes and they would supply uh, sufficient healthy food that everybody could eat so that nobody was disadvantaged or, um, favorite, or encountered favoritism or that the parents were required to put just healthy food that everybody could eat in the tuck boxes. So you know, just a little illustration of different ways um, to make things genuinely fair in the workplace. There's a nice model that I found here which illustrates the four elements of inclusion. The first one being people being treated equitably with respect. So that is differentiated support and participation without a sense of people having favourites or being treated more favourably than others. That people need to feel valued and belonging, which is experienced when people think their authentic sense is valued by others and they feel connected to a group which is about not having to put on a mask uh, to feel that you're accepted or conforming. To feel safe and open to speak out without fear of embarrassment or retaliation and therefore being empowered and growing to do their best work. So ultimately, to summary, summarise it, inclusion is about feeling confident and inspired. And this is a culture that an inclusive leader can create. So let's look at your strategies, Greg. Thank you, Danielle. This is the last poll in our webinar today. And this asks, what strategies do you use to foster inclusion and diversity in your organization? Again, it's a long list, so we'd just like you to choose three, please. The top poll 
today result is uh, flexible working without loss of status, which uh, had a 55% score. Um, and followed by mentoring sponsorship. Now that's really important because that helps that sense of being included, being accepted and being able to be authentic. And it accelerates the development of people coming through the organization um, who are diverse. Role modeling by top executives. Oh, we have uh, that some way down the list today. So uh, that is an interesting one because we're going to be talking about that. So maybe that's a start point for some of you. Listening to concerns, communicating the benefits, um, unconscious bias training, social events, um, and very few people are using a variety of media to reach diverse candidate pools. And I wonder if that's because that's not something that people are really aware of, um, but maybe something for you to explore. And another thing that's really valuable is the secondments and stretch assignments, because let's see if people are working flexibly without loss of status, then one would hope they would be offered the same secondments and stretch assignments that people that are working in the office nine to five, five days a week. So uh, yeah, again, some interesting results and some uh, perhaps insights for some of you there. So culture, what is culture? It's how we do, and we would say, and improve things around here. And why do we want to create this culture of diversity or, um, and inclusion? Well, there are three main reasons and they're to be effective, uh, to continuously improve what and how we do things, and importantly, to enjoy what we do because all of these things contribute to better productivity and happier workplaces, which in turn increases productivity. And these are, are mutually um, inclusive. One is not sustainable long term without the others. So let's take a look at the role of the leader. And this is why I pointed this out in the, um, in the, in the poll results today. Creating the right climate is the most important sustainable thing a leader can do. And you would be amazed at how rapidly a leader um, shifts the climate through their behavior and their actions from the first day that they take over the role. And uh, I'm going to use a pertinent example at the moment because we've seen in the last year or so President Trump come into power in the United States of America. Now it's quite clear that he created a change of climate quite rapidly and whilst everybody on this webinar will have their own individual view about the Trump administration, what is obvious is that things started to change very quickly. Um, through the things that he did, the things that he said, and the response of the people around him uh, to those pronouncements and that behavior. And that has created a culture shift within the White House and in American policy much more broadly. Now, of course, we still don't know, it's far too early to know what the ultimate um, impact on organizational performance, both in the United States and beyond will be, but it is fairly obvious that it will be a significant one. And that's why it's a really crucial thing for leaders to realize that what they do really matters, how they behave really matters because people take their cue from the leader. So again, I'm going to leave you a moment to take a look at these statistics and then um, explain them a little. Now, we talk about inclusive leaders being transpersonal and we'd like to see them create sunny climates. And they would do this because firstly, they have a commitment, a real genuine commitment to diversity because it aligns with their own values. They genuinely believe in the business case for diversity and inclusion and they articulate that commitment authentically. They bravely challenge the status quo and take personal responsibility for change. In our terms, they would be radical ethical and authentic. They're humble about their own capabilities and they invite contribution from others. They're also conscious of their own blind spots and their systemic flaws, and they work hard to ensure that there are opportunities for all. They're curious, they have an open mindset and they're willing to listen without judgment and seek to understand. They're culturally intelligent, they're attentive to the cultures of others and they're adaptive. And very importantly, they're collaborative. 
they empower others to create the conditions for diversity of thinking to flourish. So how can we help people become more aware of their own values in order to become inclusive and transpersonal? Well, we've developed, and um, there's more of this in our book, um, Leading Beyond the Ego, this touchstone, which is a standard by which something is judged. And we'd like to encourage leaders who are on this journey to create their own touchstone and use it in order to gauge the quality of their decision making against and to bring into their conscious decision making processes. So on the right hand side, we have what we would think are the fixed qualities for transpersonal leaders, which are all the things we've talked about being ethical, authentic, emotionally intelligent, performance enhancing um, by setting the right climate. And on the left hand side, we have some example values and these are those created by a colleague of mine who did so feeling that he wanted to select three that he felt were absolutely integral to who he is and three that he felt were aspirational that he wished to enhance and what we have done is we've created this blank for you that you will have within the slides that you get at the end of this webinar for you to fill in your own core values we've obviously pre-populated the transpersonal qualities and we've divided these into three areas so hard and soft personal conscience values and self-determination values because of course if you're trustworthy but you don't have any energy or you are um, have a, a strive for excellence, but you don't have resilience, these things will not come into reality. They won't come into being. So that there is a balance between the personal conscience values and the self-determination ones. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list. You may have other values that are very precious to you. So again, I would encourage you to populate one of these for yourself and to encourage your leaders to do so, to enable them to become more in touch with their best selves in their decision making and how they lead their, the organization. So this is a great a memoir for um, inclusion and diversity best practice. And um, I'm not going to talk through them because that would um, be unnecessary, but it does summarize the best practice we've been discussing. And I hope this will act as an aid memoir for you when you receive the slides after the, after the uh, webinar. But where does change start? Well, change start with oneself. It's the biggest challenge for a leader and it's the biggest danger to point the finger at other people and not realize that actually when you're pointing at your finger at somebody else and try it while we're on the call, point your finger out and you'll realize there are three fingers tucked into your hand pointing back at you. We have to change ourselves because the only way that we can change other people is by altering our behavior and their behavior will alter in consequence of that and in response to that. So it's a handy reminder. Um, Thank you, Danielle. Uh, sorry. I'd just like to um, open up, well, you find the slide. Uh, I'd just like to open up now the ability for people to ask questions um, and open a, a, a Q&A session. So um, whilst, whilst you get your creative juices flowing, by the way, the Q&A facility should be at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that and type in your question, then uh, we'll be able to see it. In the meantime, Danielle, I, I, I have a question for you. Uh, and that is, if we were to plan and, and undertake an intervention in an organisation, what might that look like? Um, I guess it depends on the stage of development the organisation was at. Um, but I mean, one very good thing to start with is to do some unconscious bias training and establish where people were and uh, then to group people together to start to explore what that means for them um, and another very valuable way of getting people to start to think about diversity is um, i'm sure that most of our children will have brought in things to school for show and tell and um, encouraging people from different backgrounds with different ideas 
to um, bring things in to share with other people in a social environment, whether it's a lunch meeting or a breakfast meeting, because evening meetings are too easy to avoid with family commitments. I'd suggest it was during the daytime so that people start to enjoy and appreciate one another's perspectives and one another's cultures. Um, creating champions who genuinely believe in this. So within any bell curve of change, there are always early adopters and uh, laggards. And to harness the energies of those early adopters and have them as champions that spread the commitment to diversity and the value of it in their own um, smaller groupings so that it cascades. And very importantly, to listen to those people, even though they may be ones that are very resistant to change and not like what is happening, because if they feel heard and that their concerns have been addressed, they're far more likely to be open to the changes that you're trying to implement. So, I mean, that's in a nutshell some of the practical ways that you could implement this. Um, and what we do would depend on the level of development and the type of diversity that the organisation were preparing for. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, so we have a question from Mark. Um, and Mark asks, can you give an example of where a leader or organisation changed their behaviours radically for the better as a result of understanding the principles of diversity uh, and real leadership principles? And, and real, he's put uh, as, as uh, in capitals. So I don't know if that implies anything to do with radical, ethical, authentic leadership. Uh, um... I think I'm going to ask Greg to answer this one because he ran a program in a very difficult environment, um, which was actually the environment that resulted in this massive increase in productivity. So I think I'm going to I invite Greg to respond to that one, given he's got a live example. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think that um, the, the key principles here is that things don't change overnight. Uh, and so what you need is, uh, you know, from a neuroscience perspective, we know that in order to build new habits, you need to rewire the brain. Uh, so uh, the example, and I, and I can't uh, give the organization's name for um, obvious reasons, but uh, within, we ran a program that took people through, you know, how to become uh, better leaders using emotional intelligence and looking at all the various different leadership styles which was really good because actually what that helps is to produce followers in an organization. And once you've got followers in an organization, then you begin to move into more radical areas. And this, um, this example called into question, we moved into the transpersonal space about looking at people's values, ethics, the way they made decisions, their judgment. And you could see that because we brought that into full consciousness, the decisions that they were making and their behaviours were changing quite radically in the way that they interacted with their colleagues. So, I mean, it had huge results. And as Danielle, as you uh, rightly pointed out earlier, uh, they were, although it wasn't intended to set out this way, the return on the investment for the for the program uh, was massive. Thank you. Does that uh, answer your question, Danielle? Because it, it, I'm just conscious that uh, yeah, we've got uh, uh, some further questions on right. on the line, right. so we might move yes. to them. Yeah, I'll move on to McCarty's um, question. What's what's the difference between mentoring and role modelling? Um, well, one can be part of the other, but the first is role modelling is about the behaviour of the individual. So the impact of the leader is felt beyond the people that he's actually got direct contact with and can role model. And, and if we look at, at the Donald Trump example, um, he wasn't mentoring, or he doesn't mentor, all the people whose behavior has changed as a result of his role modeling. So I think that that's a fairly obvious one. However, somebody that's seeking to be a great role model would be mentoring the people that are close to them uh, that they are able to work with directly. So I think mentoring is part of role modeling, but uh, can, is entirely distinct from it. Um, the quantified data that we have, we understand the data is, um, is global. Uh, it comes from a Gallup workplace studies, a cumulative Gallup workplace studies. It comes from a study, 2012 global work 
four studies and from a Deloitte um, study published in January 2018 in the Deloitte Review. Uh, so I'm afraid I don't have that data off the top of my head, but those sources can be interrogated for it. Um, the 6733 non-Christian Christian, again, it's a, it, it, I'm sure that it's taken from either Gallup polls or from um, uh, the sort of data that we have that is carried out in different countries that it, that asks about people's backgrounds, religious preferences and so on and records those. Again, one would have to interrogate the sources, so be it Deloitte or um, uh, Hay Group research, uh, that uh, um, I don't don't have that information in detail, I'm afraid. Okay, thanks, Danielle. Uh, so, Mark, you've confirmed that you were referring to the acronym Radical Ethical and Authentic. So, thank you very much. Um, Greg, Leanne's question. Yes, uh, Leanne uh, has sent a question. How would you make the case for diversity to an organisation that's either reluctant to change or doesn't even realise it needs to change? Well, that's an interesting one. Mm. Danielle? Yeah, uh, that, that's a challenge. And in fact, it's not dissimilar to a question that uh, I had after last night's webinar where I'm, I'm going to try and have a one to one chat with the person um, uh, later on to try and explore what uh, what they've done. I guess there are some people who will never change. And again, it's the standard bell curve. You have to understand that there are some people that will never change. It's not easy to enable people to change, but the first thing you have to do is to find the people that are willing to listen, that are willing to make their voice heard, that are willing to be um, uh, to be heard in that nature, in, in that way. Um, and ideally start as high up the organization as you can and try to exert influence. Most people and senior leaders are at base try to be very logical and there are lots of things that we have to say in, in the book about um, using just the logical side of our brains without harnessing other areas of it uh, but to appeal to the logical side of our brains which is where we've been encouraged to make our decisions throughout our school careers and most of our lives actually bringing together the data and the evidence for this and the logic behind it may help them start to be prepared to open their minds to the fact that this has a bottom line value um, and that it can solve some of their business problems. So it's also about identifying where their pain points are in the business and matching those up with these as some of the solutions that might address those. So in principle, actually meeting people where they are to begin with and then trying to see things from their perspective and then help introduce them to a stretch perspective by starting from where they are and how what you're proposing relates to solving the problems that they acknowledge. I hope that helps. I, th I think it does. Uh, from my perspective, I thought this was, Leanne, uh, an interesting question. Is, uh, you know, diversity in an organisation tends to lead to diversity of thinking. And when we consider uh, all of the things which we know are going to be coming along like artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, globalization, the impact of these things that are going to have on companies. If I was chief exec of a company, uh, I would want to have the broadest, uh, most diverse thinking in my organization as possible because you know, these, these elements are going to throw out challenges and problems that we've never encountered before. So, you know, the, the, the broader the, the, the thinking in my organization that I can tap into uh, would be, you know, absolutely fantastic. And, and, and the example I can, I can kind of give you from a personal perspective is that um, we, we, this is a very different example, but we had a shed in the garden uh, that we needed moving about uh, 50 meters. And uh, I had put the shed up and, you know, it took me a, a day, two days to put the shed up. And then because it needed moving, I thought, oh my goodness, no, this is a day to dismantle it and another day to put it up in the other location. Uh, and so I asked um, a friend of mine who was from the Netherlands, actually, uh, and he came around. He does odd jobs. That's his, that's his business, uh, kind of an odd job guy. And he came around and he said, oh, yeah, I can do that. Uh, it'll take me two hours. How do you kind of do it in two hours? Anyway, he said, 
I'll do it tomorrow. And he came around and he came around with a mate and a couple scaffold poles and he just rolled it like they built the pyramids to the new location, didn't dismantle it at all. And that's a great example of diverse thinking that, that I didn't have. And, um, you know, it's a very different, uh, very different example. So I say again, if I was chief exec of an organization, I would want the broadest and most diverse thinking in my organization as possible. There's something that has, actually is worth adding to that, and that is that some very uh, forward-thinking organisations are creating shadow boards of uh, millennials and younger people to enable them to test the decision-making and uh, check the decision-making of the board, particularly in relation to rolling out new technologies. So as just an example of how some of very forward-thinking organisations are harnessing that diversity. Um, so... Okay, one last question, um, and this is from McCarty, uh, and his question is, how do we enhance team collaboration in the context of cultural diversity? Okay, well, some of the things that we've already spoken about will help. Um, people have to feel included and belonging to the team, and they have to feel authentic in the team. So you know, I would say, for example, um, my favorite food is chocolate but I wouldn't stay very healthy if I ate nothing but chocolate all the time. And for, um, and for, so, and I learned to love lots of different foods and food is generally a common denominator with a lot of people. So for example, getting people to appreciate one another's cultures by some kind of um, a lunchtime event where they, bring all their different foods and share them so that people start to feel accepted and valued for who they are and what they're bringing, uh, bringing to the table. And that's just a very tiny example, but buddying people up from different um, backgrounds so that one mentors the other or there's a peer support mechanism going on where they both support each other and therefore they get to know each other. And it's that building knowledge of one another that builds trust that builds collaboration. And there really isn't any substitute for trust building and it doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen by accident. Well, it can happen by accident, but ultimately um, we need to break down that sense of all oh, that person's different from me because this is very deeply engraved behavior. Um, we were programmed in our um, stone age brains to trust friend and, and beware of foe. And so we were, built to recognize people that were like us and to trust them more readily. So therefore we're trying to overcome stone age defaults. So it needs a little bit of help. Um, some mixed dance classes and all sorts of things that you could do that harness the human being, the individual and not just the work persona. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, before we, uh, we close, I'd just like to draw people's attention uh, to the slide that's on the screen at the moment. Uh, Routledge, who are our publishers for the book Leading Beyond the Ego, uh, are currently offering a 20% discount. And I think, I believe that this 20% discount applies to their um, whole portfolio of books. So if you type in that, uh, the discount code uh, on their site, which there is a link to it at the top of the slide, then you can get a 20% discount on both Leading Beyond the Ego and uh, their other books. Of course, uh, Leading Beyond the Ego is also available on the Amazon site around the world as well, if you're not able to access the Routledge site. So Danielle, if you just uh, move on to the, thank you. Uh, and we will be sending you the, the recording and the slide uh, pack for this, for uh, attending the, the webinar. Uh, but we just want to emphasize that if you have any further questions, just as somebody did yesterday, have any further questions or issues that you would like to um, talk about or ask our opinion on, if you respond to the email um, that uh, you'll get the pack from, then we'd be very happy to engage with you. Thanks, Danielle. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, thank for you. attending the webinar. Um, it's been a lively discussion. We've had some great questions in. And thank you very much.